welcome. My name is Julian Schlossberg, and the name of our show is Movie Talk. Today I have as my guest the TCM host, turn a classic movie primetime host. But he's a journalist, he's a film critic, he's a contributor to CBS Sunday Morning, and his name is Ben Mankiewicz. And despite the Mankiewicz incredible imprimatur that people know, he grew up in Washington, D.C., and that was not the major thing, movies. Let's ask Ben what it was. What was major? Oh, politics. To me, the movie business is the other business that the family is in. You know, my dad was a fairly big deal in democratic politics in the in the 1970s and 80s in Washington. And, you know, he was president of National Public Radio for a while during that time, too, a job he really loved, started Morning Edition. And, you know, he was Bobby Kennedy's press secretary, and uh, he came to D.C. actually in the, in the 60s uh, after getting out of the Peace Corps. Bobby Kennedy hired him. They met while my father was in the Peace Corps in Peru, and Bobby hired him. And they ran George McGovern's campaign with Gary Hart in 1972, and he, he was just a... Uh, like everywhere he went, when I was a little boy, people stopped him and thanked him. You know, it's strange because that's what happens to me. And, you know, strange because they're thanking me for, you know, work that John Ford and Frank Capra and Michael Curtiz did. But it's a nice spot to be in. But it always reminds me of how I'd just be out and somebody would come up to my father and just say, I just want to thank you. It happened every week that we went shopping together. Well, it sounds to me like he was your hero in many ways. Oh, my God. No, it's not in every way. He was he was also a great dad. I mean, you know, he was incredibly busy. And But, I mean, if he missed three of my basketball games, you know, of which I had like 115 over four years in high school, I would be surprised. I mean, if he missed it because he was out of town, that was like the only reason. Now, you have an older brother, Joshua, we know from Dateline. Were you overpowered by him? Was he kind of, I mean, there were so many years separating you. Overpowered? Powered by my brother Josh, no one has. You, know, if you, you, you haven't met my brother Josh. Then. That's true. I, I haven't. We don't speak, my brother. So yes, is the answer to your question. Josh was a, and still is, this gigantic presence in my life, only in a good way. He's again. I mean, I was just super lucky. I had this incredibly attentive father and this great big brother who, you know, I don't know how excited he was to get me because he was already 11 and a half. But by all accounts, as soon as I arrived, he was like, oh, this is the greatest thing in the world. And so it's been a thrill to be his little brother. And he, you know, I mean, he taught me everything that I know about being on television. And I was a reporter first. He taught me how to be a reporter. He taught me how to you know, do a stand up. He taught me, he taught me how to write a piece. I think about every time I work on a Sunday morning piece, I think, well, what would my brother say this line? <laughs> Tell me, though, you describe yourself as a shy boy. Is that because of your father and brother, you think? I think that that's probably true. My family was, you know, there's a lot of serious conversations at the table. And I was much younger. My folks were both in their 40s when I was born in 1967. Yeah, so I was shy. And, you know, the dinner table conversation, you know, when I'm nine and they're talking about the 1976 presidential, I mean, they were seven years old and Watergate was a daily topic of conversation in our house and over dinner. And my father testified before the Watergate committee. And my dad was on Nixon's enemies list, which he is, you know, was always thought was one of the great honors of his life. Yeah. And I didn't know what was going on. I didn't read a lot as a kid. And so I just, you know, I sort of didn't feel like it was my place to talk. They certainly tried to include me, but mostly I just shut up. Yeah. And then that led over to where I really didn't talk in school, except to my friends until I, until like eighth or ninth grade. I didn't really find a voice, I would say, until high school. And yet you were known as a fast talker. So when you did find it, I guess you started moving. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My mom always thought I talked too fast. But my mom, like, I, I mean, I, I like, I was unemployed for two years before I got the TCM job. And I got this job and it was you know, this amazing job. And, you know, they've only had one host, Robert Osborne. I'm the second host they hire. And my mom just was always like, you know, she'd be like, oh, I'm so sorry that they're not going to let you write your own scripts. And you're like, <laughs> mom, Mom, like this is amazing. <laughs> what just happened is amazing. I haven't worked in two years, right? Yeah. And I've applied for 800 jobs and this is by far the best one. And I got it, right? <laughs> and then she'd be like, oh, I saw your intro today. I'm like, oh, you know, you're great. She goes, your, your pants are too long. And I, I don't think I can understand what you're saying. And if I can't understand it, I'm sure my friends don't either. So that was a <laughs> yeah. little insight to my mother. Well, I think all our mothers seem to have that ability. It was really, I remember a famous playwright we were in the back of the theater on opening night before the uh, crowd had come in, and his mother came in and pointed to the orchestra and said, empty, empty, empty. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it really is. It's a 
It's a very strange skill. Yeah. She was super proud of me, but it was very hard for her to get past that stuff. Yeah, I just, it was, uh, I was definitely, I was incredibly shy. All teachers were like, you know, how do we, what do we have to do to get Ben to open up? Because they'd say, I'd see him with his friends. I know he's capable of this. And it still feels like when I still go to a party here, I'm somewhere where my wife isn't with me, or if I'm not with some other people in my group, I do not know what to do. That's so interesting. Now, tell us about the Georgetown Day School. I gather it was a very important early, well, to say formative years, but more importantly, from kindergarten to 12, 12th grade. You know, I went to Tufts University, but I forget sometimes. Like, I'll literally see somebody with like a Tufts sweatshirt and I'll be like, Tufts, oh, right. I went there for four years, (laughs) right? (laughs) Like, where I went to grad school matters a little bit to me. But where I went to high school and junior high and elementary school has really defined me. And many of my still closest friends, like really five of my closest friends are still from high school. And yeah, it was this wonderful sort of progressive high school. It was founded in the, I think the 30s, maybe the 40s. But the idea was that it should look in Washington, D.C. of what a public school ought to look like if the public schools were integrated. That was their initial plan. You know, we called teachers by their first names. It promoted sort of this freedom of thought and that, you know, that it was, it, it looked for iconoclasts and, but mostly it was just great. It was open and welcoming. And, you know, I know everybody didn't have the same experience there that I did, but I, I loved it. I mean, I it really, I think it defined who I am. I can't imagine a better place to sort of come out of my shyness than when I sort of started to figure it out in eighth grade and then throughout high school. Well, you know, in the Bronx where I grew up, if we called a teacher by the first name, we'd be on the floor. That would have been, oh my God. So that is a progressive school, to say the least, I would say. Now, wait, before we leave Tufts, let's talk about NYU and the fact that you were, well, a little concerned about going to NYU where you could have gone. I must have said these things to other people, and I'm sure I have, but like you read it and you knew what was important. That's very impressive, Julian. So yeah. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, I didn't get in where I wanted to go. (laughs) Like everyone in my family went to Columbia. My father went to journalism school there. My uncle Don, who was a screenwriter, went undergrad there. Uh, Herman Mankiewicz went to Columbia. Joe Mankiewicz went to Columbia. Chris Mankiewicz went to Columbia. Anyway, we had to write C attached page for other relatives (laughs) going to Columbia. (laughs) You know, I mean, Joe and Herman and, and my father it was a big deal and we put that on the application because it was true but i wouldn't let my dad make any call on my behalf that was important to me then at 18 and then i got rejected <laughs> and so <laughs> i got into two places i got into tufts and nyu and i went to tufts because it was like a couple of places higher on some dumb list but in my heart of hearts i know that also i was scared at nyu i was scared in new york columbia i could handle because it was well because everybody had gone there And it was a campus, right? I mean, it's look once you're inside the gates, it just looks like a college, right? Looks like an Eastern college. Oh, yeah. But NYU is Greenwich Village and the city is the campus. And I I was scared of New York. I was scared of a lot of things. So I don't like that I went to Tufts because I know I was scared. And I figure in time, I probably would have worked my way over to the film school at NYU, although that was not an interest at the time. But it became one in college at Tufts anyway. So... Yeah, I just hate that I made a decision out of fear. Everything worked out. It's great. Everything's fine. But I wish I'd gone to NYU. Well, Tufts wasn't a total loss because you did take a film class. I did, yeah. And somehow, the Santa Fe Trail? What the? Yeah, I don't know how I picked that movie. They wanted me to, us to pick a movie and write about it. As far as I remember, that was the Tufts had no film program at all. This was done out of something called what they call the Experimental College. But they didn't have any film program of any significance. It was just a course, like you couldn't major in it or anything. And I took this course and right away, I just liked it, man. I just connected with it. I mean, the idea of instantly of sort of putting these movies into context mattered to me. Our whole grade was this paper. I don't know how I picked the Santa Fe Trail. I'd never heard of it. I, I'm certain that's true. There's a Warner Brothers film from, I think, 1940. Yeah, I mean, and it's, you know, Michael Cortez, a European making a Western, Errol Flynn, the star, is from Australia. You got Ronald Reagan as General Custer. This is not your kind of film, one would think. No, no, not at all. And it took what interests me, I was a history major, and it took all these famous West Point graduates from the 19th century, and it put them all in school at the same time, Robert E. Lee, George Custer, 
and you know, I'm sure somebody played U.S. Grant, somebody played Stonewall Jackson, if I remember correctly. Raymond Massey was John Brown, the violent abolitionist. And it was just very obvious that, that it was 1940 that one, I thought it was really interesting that they said all these people went to West Point together and, you know, do a little research, find out very quickly that many of them were 20 years apart. But it was very clear that Raymond Massey, who was portrayed with this sort of uh, crazed messianic zeal that John Brown character was, and John Brown may have legitimately been crazy, even though his cause was just, he was very violent. I mean, he was sort of would have been seen as a terrorist. Well, he did make Harper's Ferry, put it on the map, didn't he? He did. John Brown put Harper's Ferry on the map, which yeah. I used to, we, we had a bike ride to there, but I didn't make it all the way up there because I was scared of the bike ride and I went home after the first <laughs> night. So there you go. I'm scared a lot. There you go. It was also, it's too far to bike. That's insane. Anyway, so I wrote this paper and it was very clear that the John Brown character was Hitler and the, and the good guys were coming together to stop this bad guy, even though at the same time, I'm like, I'm, this guy was fighting to end slavery for what it's worth. Probably ought to bring that up, that he was on the right side in that sense. But uh, I wrote this paper and I got an A+. Plus. I've never gotten an A plus on anything in my life. And I thought it was pretty clear it was because I liked writing it, right? I was engaged in something. So it's fitting, you know, even though my career didn't go in that direction for another 12 years or something more, longer, 15 years. That was something that, that excited me at an impressionable age. What you don't know about me, which of course is, would fill volumes, but what you don't know is that I represented Elia Kazan, and it's pronounced Elia. No one ever pronounces it correctly. I say Elia. Oh, good. No, I know. Most people say Elia. He told me that he actually went to Massey and on East of Eden and said to him, you know, that kid, Jimmy Dean, he's a slovenly little kid. You better straighten him out. And he went to Dean and said, Massey doesn't like you. He'll never like you. <laughs> and that's how some directors work. No, Kazan, when he saw an opportunity to create conflict, he thought that served his purpose. Well, I mean, he practically encouraged Natalie Wood and Warren Beatty to have an affair, right? Because he thought, oh, this is great. It's right? true. Yeah. yeah. And I think they listened from what I've told you. <laughs> they took him seriously. Yeah. <laughs> they took him seriously. Oh, I'll tell you a quick story on On the Waterfront you might like, because Kazan would tell me these stories. I would spend a lot of time with him. And what was interesting to me in that scene when they're Brando and kind of courting Eva Marie Saint, she drops a glove. Oh, yeah. It's not supposed to drop a glove. Cameraman goes over to Kazan and says, should I cut? He says, I'll kill you if you <laughs> cut. I'll kill you. So I said, so you had nothing to do with that scene, the way he takes his hand and puts it in the glove. It's very sexual and sensual. He said, I had nothing to do with any of it except I said to not cut. That was the only contribution. Right. He knew to run it. Yeah. That scene is really, you know, that's Brando's greatness, right? Yeah, it's true. And there's plenty of it in that movie. So let's go on. Why does Columbia come into your life? I mean, besides every Mankiewicz that ever walked the planet seemed to go there. But what was it that spurred you to go from Tufts to Columbia School of Journalism? I mean, I, my brother was a journalist. My father had been a journalist. I didn't want to go to law school. You know, if you're a Jewish kid on the East Coast and you don't know what you're going to do with your life, you generally go to law school. <laughs> <laughs> That's sort of, those are the rules. And I didn't want to be a lawyer. I knew that. Even though my father always said he was a lawyer for a very brief time, but he thought everybody who could should go to law school. That it was just a, you know, you learn a really, a, literally a critical way of thinking and that you could apply that to anything. He didn't want to be a lawyer either. He let, he quit the law to join the Peace Corps at, you know, nearly 40 years old, you know, 36, 37 years old, something like that. When President Kennedy said, you know, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Actually, Ted Sorensen, I think, said that. Yes, right. Ted Sorensen wrote it down. Yeah, right. You know, I, I was a journalism school, and it was a way to maybe get into Columbia, and I'd worked, and I had at least gone to Tufts, and, you know, in general, I don't know. I mean, for all I know, my dad made a call that time, even though I still asked him not to. Can I tell one quick story about that? I wish you would. So, I didn't get into Columbia, and I, and I didn't let my dad make a call. I also got rejected from Northwestern. I didn't let him make a call there, people he knew. And halfway through my freshman year at Tufts, it was uh, still first semester, like middle of October to late October. And I get a call. My father always started every conversation as if we'd already been talking for 19 minutes. You know, <laughs> like his first word was often so. You know, I pick up the phone. He goes, I'm like, hello. He goes, so I was in a conversation today <laughs> with, you know, he goes, so I got a call from the president's office at Columbia. But anyway, the president of Columbia's office called, not the president, and asked my father if he would, as, since he's an alumnus, sort of MC the evening 
that presents Joe Mankiewicz with the Alexander Hamilton Award, which is the most distinguished award the university gives to alumni. And Joe Mankiewicz also being an alumnus, and Joe, you know, four Oscars in two years. And they haven't given many, like Lou Gehrig has one. And my memory serves me at that time, they'd given like 17 of these over the course of whatever, 80 years of giving them. They don't give them every year. And my father said, no, curtly. Right. <laughs> and since my father, I guess, knew the president of Columbia in some way, not they weren't close, but they knew each other. He called later and he said, hey, Frank, you know, it's, I'm so sorry if we, I should have called myself and if there's some issue with you and Joe, we didn't know about it. I hope it didn't create any problem. You know, if you don't want to participate, no problem at all. And my father goes, oh, what are you talking about? I'm thrilled you're giving this to Joe. It's a great honor. And, you know, I'm very happy for Joe. We're very close. And the guy waits. <laughs> He's like, well, but you, you don't want to participate in it in any way? And my father goes, no. He goes, well, can I ask why? He goes, because you didn't let my goddamn kid into school. Right? <laughs> and the president says, well, I, I didn't I realize that applied. He's like, well, I didn't, you know, you should, you should have called me. He's like, I didn't think we had to call when America was applied or something like that, right? <laughs> and we hadn't given it. There's no way we'd given a dollar. Like, they don't, my dad just didn't, that wasn't where he gave his money to school. But anyway, he's like, and so the guy's, let me look into it. I'll call you back. So he looks at, you know, he calls back the next day. He's like, I had the admissions office. Look, Ben was a pile. He could have fallen left. He could have fallen right. I just, you know, he was in the middle. We'd only let whatever, 7% in or something, you know, would he like to come now? And it's like <laughs> October 23rd. He's like, he could just come Monday and we'll work out the transfer stuff. We'll just figure it out. He goes, it's easier if he came in January, but he can do whatever he wants. He can come now, he can come in January. So my father was calling to say, do you want to go to Columbia? Right. And I was going after a girl and I was embarrassed by all this. And so I, I, I didn't, I stayed at Tufts, but that's how easy it would have been to get in. And then the next day, my dad called after I say no, and then he goes, well, what about Northwestern? Cause I figured the cat was out of the bag. So I called them too. And you can go there too. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> He just reversed them like with one phone. Call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you actually waited and you did go to Columbia. I did, yeah. Was it a good experience? It was a great experience. I didn't have a lot of confidence that I was smart. I mean, I still don't. I know I can, uh, I can, I, I, you know, I wear glasses, so I look smart. And I know what I know, but there's only like 120 kids in the class at Columbia. It's a one year program. And there's some unbelievably bright kids there. And if there were 120 kids, like it occurred to me like four weeks in, I'm like, I'm like the 58th smartest kid here. There's like 57 <laughs> kids in front of me, but they're like 60 behind me. I'm fine. Like I am, I am right in the middle and I can hang with these people. It's okay. Like I don't not belong here. That actually gave me a fair amount of confidence that, you know, how I thought stories should be structured and what I thought was important and what stories should be told by journalists in general or how they should tell them that, that it was an okay place to be. So it did, it made a big difference to me. Well, it certainly seems to me that you must have always had a certain amount of verbal acuity because you certainly, you didn't all of a sudden bloom at a very older age. It just that you were, as you said earlier, shy. Yeah, I, I was shy. I lacked confidence. And I could always make my father and to some extent my mother and brother laugh, like, you know, even when I was still shy. Like, so I, I had some ability to, you know, get them and mm -hmm. they liked hearing from me. And I got, I very quickly learned as I think is true for, you know, a lot, I'm not obviously not a comedian, but I, you know, you, I, you hear this from enough comedians who I've interviewed and who I'm friends with. I love comedians and I'm so impressed with them, you know, and, and like the ability to learn how to make their folks laugh. And then you just, that just, it, that gives you such a, a burst of joy that like that, that cadence, that manner of speaking, you then replicate. And so I okay. think that's what it was sort of learning how to tell a story to my father and my brother taught me how to tell a story. Well, often the comedians will tell you that they were the class clown as well. Yeah, I, I wasn't a class clown. I said I'd fire in things. I was not unfunny. It feels always weird to brag about you being, but like, yeah, I, class clown. I loved making people laugh. And since I was shy, I wasn't going to like expound on Shakespeare yeah, in class. Right. But I might, you know, if something funny occurred, that's how I started talking was saying something funny and then getting a reaction and thinking, oh, well, that's fun. So, all right, we've got you through Tufts. We got you through Columbia. And now how the hell does Charleston, South Carolina get on your radar? Well, you go back to that idea of being, I knew that I hadn't gone to NYU because I was scared and that bothered me. And so when, after I'd gone to grad school and I had some confidence and I'd lived in New York and realized it's actually pretty great. I thought, I also, you know, I read, uh, this is stupid, but I read the, you know, Prince of Tides. 
like I read Pat Conroy. And I read the other one, the Conrad. John Voight made the movie. That's right. John Voight made the movie. But I read that too. I read The Prince of Tides and I read that. And I thought, first I thought, I'll go down and I'll teach in the South. Because it occurred to me that I was wrong about something. And, and I, I, that occurs to me a fair amount. That like I'd been making fun of the South and, and I didn't know what I was talking about. Right. I'd never been there. I didn't know anything about it. You know, I took a couple of civil rights courses at Tufts that were really meaningful. And I, and then I got off the teaching part because I wanted to be a journalist that was still there. And I wanted to be, I, I did some TV work at Columbia too, in the TV component of at journalism school. And I, so I made a tape, I put it together. I worked as a sports producer in Washington, DC. I put a tape together with those guys there and shot a couple other things where I could, took a couple of things from Columbia and I got, I rented a car and I just drove from DC to, you know, through North Carolina and South Carolina. I applied in Florence and Columbia and Savannah, well, like Winston-Salem, I just, and Charleston. I just dropped tapes off and met with people. And I got offered a job as an editor at Savannah and but I connected with this guy named Don Feldman, the news director in Charleston. He didn't make much time. He like put my tape in. He watched about 30 seconds of it. And he was like, mm, I'll hire you as a producer and I'll put you on the air within a year. Whoa. And so I ended up taking that job. Charleston's a great place, a really lovely city. South Carolina has got some issues, but Charleston's a great place. You know, beautiful parts of the whole state and beautiful people there too. I mean, I, I, I liked a lot of people there. You spent five years there, so you must have liked it. I did. I turned down a job in Cincinnati to stay in Charleston. I'm interested in knowing what made you leave Charleston, and I guess go to Miami. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, you know, five years, if you if you stay in the 107th market, even though Charleston plays a lot bigger, you know, played like a top 50 market, top 50 top. 60 market. We didn't shoot our own stories. We didn't edit our own stories. We had, we had, you know, we had photographers and we had editors. So it was like a real, real newsroom where, you know, skilled people did their job and did it well. I liked it very much, but you know, almost five years, like four and a half, five years. I just, it was clearly time to go. I didn't start this until I was 26. So it wasn't like I went there right after college. And I got offered this job in Miami that I thought, you know, first I got a call from this news director in Miami that they were interested in me. And, you know, and I thought Miami is an exciting news town, but then it turned out to be channel 69. It was a startup station. It was not the dream job in Miami that I thought it would, but it, then it turned into that. So I took that job. And again, that that's what really made my career was going to Miami. How do you think the folks from Miami found out about you in Charleston? Oh, the old, old fashioned way. I had an agent. I mean, if you're in news at that time, at least in the 90s and, and prior to that too, and probably still now, but if you want to get discovered and move up, I mean, you know, it pays so poorly now. It paid pretty poorly then. I mean, I made $16,000 my first two years in Charleston, uh, 16000 a year. I remember when I got a raise, we started getting overtime. I got a raise and overtime. So I went from like 16000 to 32000 and I was 30. And I thought, I can never spend this money. Like, I can't <laughs> spend $30,000 in a whole year? I got a whole year to spend $30,000? You know, this is great. Well, in your blood, your grandfather could have done it pretty quickly. My grandfather could have. He didn't care about money, though. Boy, yeah. he didn't care about money. He didn't care about <laughs> losing it. He didn't care about making it. He didn't care about gambling it. He didn't care about giving it away. He didn't care about borrowing it and not paying it back. We'll get to him a little yeah. later. But anyhow, I like the idea that you could not figure out what to do with thirty grand. Yeah, it's true. I didn't have enough vices. Anyway, you know, this job in Miami was this Barry Diller station, and he was a startup. He wanted to reinvent local television local news, local sports, but he had tons. He wanted to program eventually, you know, 12 hours a day of new programming produced locally. And he spent like 15 million bucks to build a station on South Beach. I lived on South Beach. I worked there. So I walked to work most days. It was a really great, really thrilling three years. I barely left South Beach. I really didn't even really explore Miami. Uh, I did the first year because I was a reporter, but the next two, I got to host the show when the enormously talented anchor that they'd hired left and went back to New York. She worked for Good Morning America for a time. This woman named Amy Atkins, who's a great writer, funny, smart, brilliant, just brilliant. I was in awe of her. But she didn't, she, whatever, she wanted to go back to New York. It's where her life was. And what Barry Diller discovered there in Miami was that if you're going to run, make a TV station, if you're going to do all this stuff, you got to hire people. And some of those people are going to have to come from Los Angeles and New York, you know, maybe Chicago, but places where this stuff is done, right? So they were hiring people who didn't quite know how to do it. So it was a little like watching a Japanese movie on American television in 1977. Like the mouth didn't match the audio in yeah. a lot of our shows. Yeah. Like, you know, sometimes the commercials were incredibly loud, right? Like nothing quite, it looked like a college station. <laughs> the new show that we did was really good. We won some really cool awards. We did great stuff. 
We had to have a point of view. It could be left wing, could be right wing. You could have no opinion on a story, but even if you had no opinion, you had to like literally kind of say, here's why you shouldn't care about this story that I'm telling you about. So that was a lot of fun. And then when I started hosting it, these amazing things happened. The 2000 election came in Florida, in South Florida. My mom called me on election day and said she's scared that she voted for Pat Buchanan. She lived in up in Boca Raton, about an hour north. I thought she was uh, in Palm Beach County. I thought she was crazy. And then late, the next day we had her on the air and she was describing <laughs> everything she'd seen. And she's like, she kept pointing at it and, and that the election workers who came in to help her, because my mom definitely would have brought workers in, but she, the election workers came to help her. They couldn't even quite figure out whether the, which one was a vote for Gore and which one was a vote for Buchanan. Yes. And that butterfly ballot was so unbelievably poorly designed. You could see exactly what happened, as evidenced by the fact that Pat Buchanan got about seven times more votes in Palm Beach County. I think that's right than he did in Broward or Dade County. And that cost the election. I mean, it's, it's not hyperbole. It's obvious, given the fact that the final result was in the 500s. There were thousands and thousands of extra votes for Pat Buchanan in Palm Beach County that were clearly meant to go for Gore. So it was thrilling to have that story. And then the Elian Gonzalez story, the little kid whose mom died tragically trying to come over from Cuba. And he made it. He had you know Cuban-American family in Miami and they wanted him to stay. But his dad lived in, in Havana and wanted him to come home. And we were like, hey, man, he's got to go home. It's his dad who didn't want him to leave in the first place. So this is not a complicated story, we thought. <laughs> but the many Cuban-Americans in Miami th thought we were wrong, but it was very exciting. And so we could say that. And we, I was doing a show outside on a Friday and I got spit at. It was great. I loved it. It was very exciting. Well, let me get a couple of things straight. Was this Channel 69 was obviously a UHF station with not that much power because obviously the lower the number, the more power you have. Right. So, but you were able to get into Palm Beach and Broward and Dade. And I don't know that we got into Palm Beach, but by then, like Palm Beach had its, Palm Beach was its own market. Broward was the Miami market. All of Broward was part of Miami. I'm sure they could get Palm Beach stations over the air. But by, this is, you know, this is a 2000 election. Everybody, almost everybody had cable. Yes, so right. we were on the cable system. So it didn't really, then it doesn't matter anymore. That's right. That's very true. Well, let me ask this. You decide to leave Miami after a few years. Was L.A. in the back of your head or did you have to leave Miami? Well, I had to leave Miami and L.A. was in the front of my head. I mean, like I, I was by then I'd switched agents in part because the original agent, they weren't paying attention to me that I saying that I didn't want to work in news anymore. Like I knew this was a beautiful place. And if the news had been like it was in Miami, I, I could have stayed. But anyway, he sold the stations like he gave up. His plan was to turn Diller's plan. Barry Diller's plan was to turn these 13 UHF stations he bought all like Channel 69, like it was Channel 58 in Dallas and Channel 85 in Atlanta. I mean, it was crazy numbers, right? Yes. But he bought the rights to the Atlanta Hawks and the Dallas Mavericks and Miami Heat. We had the Florida Marlins, now the Miami Marlins. And that was part of his local programming. It just didn't work. And he only made like $150 million off his failure. <laughs> yeah. By the way, that was one of his slow years. That's right. That's right. So he sold all the 13 stations. And Miami, we were the only ones that actually launched full local programming. As I said, a couple others had sports programming, but nothing else. I know he sold them to Univision. That's right. Or Telemundo. So I had to leave. I had like seven or eight months on my contract left. So that was, that was, that was a nice period where I was at least I could move and not panic. But then, you know, that it was, I think six months, June and like in the next new year, I, I was out of money and I, but I, so I drove out to LA when we, when the station shut down, I, I drove across the country. I figured this is where they make TV. This is where I should go. And LA had it always been a goal because of the Mankiewicz name or nothing to do with that at that point? Probably something to do with that. I mean, my folks had been there. California was just a, my brother was born here or in San Francisco, but grew up here in LA before they moved to DC, right before I was born. Yeah. So he was here then he was back in LA. He'd had a job at a local station in LA. He was about to start at Dateline or he was with a news magazine at Fox first. And then, uh, and he's been at Dateline for 30 years now. I just wanted to go, you know, I mean, I wanted to be near my brother. That's a big part of it, but this is where TV was. And California, I'd always seen to me as this really special, wonderful place. I didn't like to travel much. I was a, you know, I was a shy, I guess, shyness. I was, I didn't like to travel. I, I mean, literally stupid things. I didn't like sleep well anywhere else. And I didn't like to go to somebody else's bathroom, like all these things bothered me most of my life. So I was somewhat sheltered for a kid who probably shouldn't have been sheltered. But California, like sports started early. Like that was a great thing to me. I mean, I, when I'd wake up like Sunday mornings at 930 in DC and there wouldn't be football for three and a half hours, it was the worst three and a half hours ever. 
Like to me, I was like, wow. And in, I'm like, can we talk in California? They start at 10? Oh my God, let's go live there. <laughs> well, tell me a little bit about your time. You know, we'll now get to what I'm sure people are the most interested in. You don't think they're worried about how I sleep when I'm not in my own bed? That's weird. That sounds so interesting. Yeah. I think it depends on if they're a groupie or not. That's right. Totally. <laughs> yeah. But I wanted to ask you about TCM. How does TCM come into your life? Well, I, I was in LA. I got here in 2001. I arrived on uh, March 25th, 2001. So I applied for like a hundred jobs out here. I mean, more. I mean, my age, I don't even know how many I applied for because most of them would have been through my agent at the time. And I had all kinds of auditions for talk shows. That was sort of my dream to host a talk show. I didn't want to do news unless it was the way we did it in Miami. I didn't want to do local news. I didn't want to cover fires. I didn't want to cover murders. I didn't want to cover silly stuff. Yeah. You know, murders aren't silly, but the way my brother does it is great. Right, sort of, you know, treats the victim with respect. Tell it tells a story, right, over an hour or two hours. But, you know, the way local news does it, it's like, you know, you can just tell that we're there for us. Like we're showing off and we're trying to get ratings and we're trying to scare people that where they live isn't safe. And, and in some, of course, some cases, some areas weren't. But I knew I didn't belong doing that. It didn't never felt right to me. So anyway, I went to uh, LA and I applied for every, you know, talk shows, game shows. I love game shows, and I thought I could maybe be good at that. I was a finalist for a couple of game shows, like one not stupid couple that were really stupid, but I never got anything. And mostly I never even got a callback, you know? So, and then TCM has this audition and I, you know, I, I, I would have said to people that I knew a lot about classic movies, but you know, then I like went to work at TCM and met people who really knew a lot about classic <laughs> movies. And uh, anyway, I learned, I learned pretty quick too. Yeah. It was just a, uh, this fortunate opportunity they the audition process was different than any other audition mostly in that it was long like you weren't rushed you were with other people and you know we were like you'd either be a panelist and somebody else was the host or you'd be the host and there'd be panelists and you'd talk about a movie and i could just tell i did well they kept asking me they'd be like okay you be the host now with these people now you be the host with these people okay now you be a guest with this host they never really let me leave other people came and went, but I was like in every group, just about. So you knew something good was going on, perhaps. I knew something good was going on. And I knew because I was, I was allowed to be myself and it was working. And so it was great. And then a few, but they made me wait a long time. Three or four months later, I, I got the job. I had one more audition when they narrowed it down to three people. Oh, wait a second. I can't let you do that. Let's go to Seven Samurai and Magnificent Seven. Oh, sure. That was the homework assignment for the audition. The first audition was to watch the Seven Samurai, Kurosawa's Seven Samurai, and John Sturgis's Magnificent Seven with you know McQueen and Yul Brenner. And just have those movies be ready to discuss them. You know, what's different about them, what the similarities are. The Magnificent Seven is an American Western version of the Seven Samurai. And the Seven Samurai was modeled at because Kurosawa loved John Ford West. So it led itself very easily to become an American Western. So I watched these movies. I mean, I, I don't know whether I'd seen them or not. I think I had. I'm pretty sure I'd seen Seven Samurai. I don't even know if I'd seen The Magnificent Seven. I probably had on TV because I certainly knew the music. It was just great. You were given this freedom. I, mean, I spent two hours talking about these movies. Did they tell you in advance that the two movies that you were going to talk about or they threw it at you? No, they told us in advance because they wanted us to have seen them recently. But it was weird because it was like some other people hadn't really seen them. Like they said, I just remember some of the other people, not all of them. There were some talented people there in that audition. But some of the people were saying things about the movies that were like, you know, I'm like, well, this movie... I'll have you know, is modeled after the other movie. You know, and you'd be like, I think they know that. I think, they, yeah. I think we got to peel back a couple of layers here if we're trying to impress these people. Yeah. Reminds me of Given in Geometry. You know? That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It was, uh, there were a lot of Givens. And then the second audition was just going and doing what Robert Osborne does. The first idea when they hired me was that they would have a uh, the weekend host that I was hired to be, that I would have guests and that there would be a conversation about the movies. But I think it occurred to them that that was going to be very hard to book. So by the yeah. time they were ready to pull the trigger and hire someone, they had decided it was just going to do what Robert Osborne did. And in a movie. And so they sent me a, a script to read. They said, you can change it if you want, but I'm not an idiot. I didn't change a word or like a word or two. Like I punctuated it differently, but I was too nervous to. Yeah. So they put it in the prompter and I read it. And the guy, <laughs> the guy doing the audition, he wasn't there by the time I started. He was like, like, I'd heard this is not your first rodeo, but he said, this is not your first barbecue, which I had not heard. <laughs> and all yeah. I had done was like read aloud. 
you know, so I was like, yeah, well, I'd been, you know, I'd been a news anchor for crying out loud. And that certainly didn't hurt. But before you get the job, even though you say you did, and of course we know you did, I love the idea of you coming home saying to your girlfriend. Yeah. So I get home and she's like, how'd it go? I go, well, it went well. I mean, I just read the story in the prompter. They had me do it twice, but they were identical. You know, I like didn't mess up and punctuated the right words. And, you know, <laughs> I knew how to say I was the bishop's wife, you know. I knew how to say, you know, from 1947, David Niven and David Niven, Cary Grant, Loretta Young in The Bishop's Wife. Like, you know, <laughs> I'd seen Robert Osborne do it. I know that's how it goes. And then I said, I tell you what, let's turn TCM on right now. And I go, if a Mankiewicz had anything to do with this movie that's on TCM, it was the afternoons because I auditioned at like 11 o'clock in the morning. So I'm back home like 1.30 in the afternoon. I'm like, so let's turn on the TV and says, the movie on has anything to do with Mankiewicz, I'll get the job. I'm not a crazy person. So I was like, I'm not saying I won't get it if it's not a Mankiewicz because odds are it won't be, right? And, and it's in the movie and it's a tight shot of Humphrey Bogart and I don't instantly recognize it right away. And then there's nothing on the screen and then there's a tight shot of Ava Gardner. And then oh. I just had a moment of like, <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> Barefoot Contessa, Joe Mankiewicz. <laughs> and it was the Barefoot Contessa. And so she hit pause or hit info and it comes up that it's the Barefoot Contessa. And she's like, what? And I'm like, my Uncle Joe wrote and directed this movie, <laughs> right? And I'm like, well, I guess I'm getting the job. And then, sure enough. Yeah. Well, tell me, do you remember when you first met Bob Osborne? I probably met him. I don't remember the first time because we were never in Atlanta at the same time. I'm maybe maybe not never, but but maybe never because TCM pretty small operation. We only had at that point one studio, and we didn't even have enough employees to really run two shoots at that point. So if there was a sh if he was shooting, he was there, and if I was shooting, I was there. We worked with the same people, same wardrobe stylist who's still there, Holly Hattesty, same makeup artist, you know, same producers, same teleprompter operator, same director, and they all loved him. So we used to do company retreats, like in the first years I was there. So there was probably a retreat in 2004. That's my guess as to when yeah. that was. And we should establish that he was the primetime host and you were the weekend host at that point. Is that right? And actually, I was marginalized. I don't mean to say that that negatively, but it was. I was not just the weekend host. I was the weekend daytime host. And like <laughs> years <laughs> later when I was like, hey, can we just lose the word daytime just to make it a little just weekend host? <laughs> and they first said, yeah. And then, then they were like, yeah, no, we can't. <laughs> it was the weekend <laughs> daytime host for a while. Yeah. Well, was it pretty intimidating for you to take over it was more intimidating in the beginning knowing that he was there and that you know and then like when we started having a festival later I, there were a couple things a couple times i met him ted turner got a star on the walk of fame and i got invited to that and robert was there and you know just the way people respected everything he said and you know i just again i just felt like this interloper and and for a while i thought yeah, this is a great job but i'll never really break through right and in the beginning and, and he and i really formed something nice but it took a while and i get it now because you know we've hired these other hosts and i all of whom i like not just a little but i like a lot they're really all friends but i don't think robert liked this young kid coming in i don't think that was his was not his favorite development it had nothing to do with me he knew uncle joe's movie all about Eve. That's right. That's right. That's right. He may have he probably thought there was an all about Eve thing happening. I was far too scared to even think about that. And we honored him on the 20th anniversary of the channel in 2014. And I, I wrote a thing and it moved him and things had already eased, but he was really, it was very kind about that. It was a nice moment for me. I had a wonderful relationship with him. And where I broadcast, I had a radio show in New York for nine years. But if there was a giant snowstorm, Bob lived across the street from the radio station. And he lived, as you know, in a building called the Osborne. Even spelled the same way. It's crazy. It's insane. Yeah. And he had nothing to do with the ownership of that building. Crazy. But what I would do, Ben, you'll get a kick out of this because you do so many interviews. If there was a huge snowstorm and I, you know, got some huskies and got me to the station, I would pick up the phone and say, Bob, put on your galoshes, cross the street, and come on over. Because I was on from 8 to midnight. It was four hours, and people weren't going to be coming as my guests. But I knew if he came, it would be great. We had a lot of fun. He was a great storyteller. And I can't tell you how it was clear to me that the way everybody at TCM spoke about him then, 
the many people who are still there speak about him now. There was just this reverence for him, and it wasn't. But they also humanized him. I mean, so they were honest about like his foibles and all, and it didn't matter. They were like he was really great. He was kind to everybody. He made everybody smarter. He was the Walter Cronkite at TCM. I mean, this wouldn't. I wouldn't have this job without him, and he had nothing to do with hiring me. But he created this job. He made it a thing that mattered. So we all owe this enormous debt of gratitude to him. And he was also, as you can, as you know, Julian, he was just he was full of decency. Yeah, he really was a fine person. He had the Hollywood Reporter. He had the Rambling Reporter, and he was kind enough to do a lot of stories on me over the years. And so he became a kind of a semi regular on my show, and I miss him to today. We're talking to TCM host and film critic. Ben Mankiewicz. We'll be right back after these words. If you like audiobooks, then you will simply love the latest from Julian Schlossberg entitled Try Not to Hold It Against Me. In his memoir read by the author, Schlossberg tells of negotiating with Al Pacino, Burt Reynolds, and Lillian Hellman, hosting the syndicated radio show Movie Talk, interviewing stars like Jack Nicholson, George Burns, Betty Davis, and Bob Hope. Experiencing the paranormal with Shirley MacLaine and Betty Hill. Restoring Orson Welles' masterly film Othello. Partying with Barbara Streisand and Liza Minnelli. Testifying in a lawsuit against the Beatles, whom he loved. And interviewing over 140 major figures for his series, Witnesses to the 20th Century. With a forward by Academy Award winner Elaine May, Try Not to Hold It Against Me gives listeners the behind-the-scenes look at the rarely seen but crucial work of a producer. Schlossberg recounts the trials and triumphs of work and play as a theater, film and TV producer, and radio host. It's a -a one-of-a-kind autobiography read by one of entertainment's true insiders. Try Not to Hold It Against Me is available on Audible or wherever you get your audiobooks. We're back with TCM host and film critic Ben Mankiewicz. It's time for the family Mankiewicz. You've gone this long, and I have to do it, Ben. I know you've never spoken about this at all. No, yeah, I don't like like talking about my family. I know, but here we go. You know, I was thinking, here's talk about armchair psychiatry. I'm looking at Herman and Joe. And then I see Frank and Don. And then I see Ben and Joshua. And I say, hmm, here's an interesting thing. Two brothers, two brothers, two brothers. Some having sibling rivalry. Some having a lot of anger. Others taking care of each other. But you and Josh seem to have, if you'll forgive me, from a distance, the healthiest relationship. Oh, by far. I I, I couldn't love my brother more. He's the greatest brother in the world. He's also just a great guy. I mean, his my brother's friends love him. Everybody loves my brother. If you meet my brother, you love him. He remembers your birthday. He he's he's a he's a, he's. he's uh, first of all, he's really great at what he does. I mean, he is a great interviewer, and he sometimes interviews people in very difficult situations. He is not afraid. He was a great reporter. He was a great political reporter. So uh, he's also spectacularly funny um, and clever. Um, and, uh, you know, he uh, – I mean, he was the best to me as a kid, and he is even now as an adult. And it's always this weird dynamic. I mean, we're – you know, we're however old we are now, you know, where I'm in my fifties, he's in his sixties and we, you know, but I'm still, you know, there's still this big brother, little brother component to our relationship, but definitely my brother got, my, my dad got along with his brother, Don, but Don was a, not an easiest guy in the world always to connect with very gifted, smart, funny. Um, and they had a nice relationship, but my brother and I by far are the, closest siblings. Although my father was incredibly close to his younger sister, uh, Johanna Mankiewicz, who was a gifted, gifted writer who died much too young. And they, they were, they were very close. And I would say my, my brother and I are more emulate that relationship between Josie Mankiewicz and, and my father. Well, let's talk in terms of Herman Mankiewicz first. Here is a man who is part of the Algonquin Round Table. A lot of people don't know that. And also a theater critic. He wrote a play that I don't think was very successful, but he was an incredible writer and producer and sadly a very unhappy man. It seems if you one reads the books or does the studies, that part of that was the self-loathing was his father, who was a teacher, 
and seemed to really kind of look down on what Herman was doing. No question. Even if he didn't look down on it, Herman presumed that he was. It was just ingrained in him. You know, the. I mean, now it's hard to imagine. I'm sure there are parents out there who'd be disappointed if their children became successful screenwriters. But most parents would get it that that's pretty great, right? It's an yeah. incredibly competitive, difficult business to succeed in, and, and Herman succeeded wildly in it. But his father came from, it was literally came from the old country, from either Poland or Germany, depending on where the border was at the time, and emigrated to the United States, I think, in the 1880s. I might have that slightly wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was the 1880s, to Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. And he was a professor. He'd been a, I think, a literature German professor. I, got, I would have to revisit a couple of the books to remind me. But he was a he was a unbelievably scholarly man and 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 stubborn and uh and judgmental and and he thought he had these two kids both brilliant both went to college early both just clearly gifted in herman and joe their, their age difference almost exactly what me and my brother are about 12 years and uh uh and you know he thought being a theater critic that's noble the theater was noble uh writing a play was was worthy. Even being a writer, even reading, writing a novel would have been great. Certainly writing, being a journalist was okay. But the movies, this, you know, filler for the masses, as as Franz Mankiewicz would see it, uh, was uh, worthless. He thought Joe should be a, a should, should, should teach. Uh, and, you know, he could write, you know, write a novel, you know, or, uh, and, and teach. But again, fi- it was incredibly disappointed when Joe followed Herman, uh, out to Hollywood. And Herman, yeah, had this sort of self-loathing that he couldn't shake. And he, you know, he, he drank, really drank himself to death. And he uh, um, he was a fun drunk by by all accounts. He wasn't mean, yeah. except to like yeah. Louis B. Mayer and, and uh, William Randolph Hearst. And it's okay to be mean to them. Was Mank an accurate portrayal from your point of view? As li- I know you didn't know your grandfather, but from what you know, was it pretty accurate, the movie? You know, the details, like the involvement in the the gubernatorial campaign that's a big part of the movie and the you know progressive candidate for governor that part clearly wasn't true because Herman w- would never have been that involved in politics that in that way but he was incredibly political and very aware loved it. They, you know, they never talked about movies my dad always said at home never talked about the business no matter who was over you know Ben Hecht come over Harpo Marx come over and the the, the, the talk was always politics the world um these were serious people um but you know herman was anti whatever you were and could so you know he you know herman famously they're sort of correct about the movies that herman was not a big union guy in those early days but he was also uh, hated the studio heads (laughs) so i mean like if you were saying yeah if somebody had said to him these unions they're going to destroy everything he'd say what the hell are you talking about? Who's going to fight Harry Cohn and Louis B. Mayer? You're going to think they're going to look out for the little guy, for the working man? You're crazy. The union is the only way to do it. Then if somebody was talking about the unions, he'd be like, hey, you're going to price everybody out of the business. This is crazy. You're going to destroy. He just, you know. Um, but what was accurate, well, the one story about uh, raising money and helping to get uh, Jews out of Germany, that was true. I, I think the movie inflated the number, but he did it, no question, and it wasn't two. Um and uh, so that's a incredible, um, you know, that was a, a real, that's something that he, I hope he was proud of. Um, uh, but what was accurate, I think, based on the way my father described him, and I wish my father had been alive to see it, uh, was I just think that, that Gary Oldman captured the essence of Herman. Like, yes. yeah, I mean, he got that. He was, you know, like you, you see that movie and you think, I bet people like that guy. Right, they wanted to hang out with him. They thought what he said was smart. He was funny. He was mean to the right people, <laughs> and yeah. uh, and he was unafraid. Um, so that part was, and he loved his wife. That's all. All appears to be true. And he did have great jobs, and he did get fired all the time. Got fired all the time, and because he, you know, I mean, like the great story that you know, I think he he wrote the Spanish Main, and they had a big scene at the end where the boat burned and. They wrote it, and then the studio didn't want to shoot it because it cost, you know, whatever, $28,000 to shoot the scene or 38 or make a number up. And Herman was outraged, and, you know, so he quit. And then they just hired somebody else to write the scene where they say, oh, my God, the boat burned. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, that, one, that cost nothing. So, I mean, like he quit for, you know, like it, uh, get somebody else to do it. And, you know, and then when they asked him to write a, a Rin Tin Tin 
movie or I don't put Rin Tin Tin. I'm dating myself. It's probably, uh, they were, but it was a dog. Maybe it was Lassie. I don't think so. I, in my head, it was Rin Tin Tin. Anyway, a, a movie about a dog that, you know, and he was like, I'm not writing a movie about a dog. Right. <laughs> right. And, uh, yeah. Uh, and so he he hands in a, a, a early draft of the screenplay where in the first scene the dog uh, uh, picks up a baby by the scruff of his neck and carries the baby into a burning building. <laughs> that was, that was, <laughs> <laughs> and like it, just stuff like that is funny, but it's going to get you ultimately. It's going to cost you your job. Yeah, they're going to show you the exit that way. Yes, right. No question. So talk a little bit, please, about the famous telegram, I guess, to Ben Heck, who we should point out was one of the great writers from front page to notorious, just a great, great writer. Yeah. So Ben Heck had been a friend of my grandfather's or Herman's back in New York. And Heck, of course, great playwright, journalist, just a gifted writer, wrote quickly and wrote well. And when Herman was writing title cards in Hollywood, came out there early, just lured by the money. And it turned out to be the money was better than he thought. He basically, I think I have it correct. He wrote to Ben Hecht. He said, it's in the movie, but in the movie, he sends a bunch of telegrams to a bunch of writers in Mank. He really only sent it to Hecht. But anyway, the telegram said to Hecht, there's millions to be made out here. Get out of here as soon as you can. Your only competition is idiots. <laughs> Don't let this get around. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> like you can come, but don't tell everybody. Cause <laughs> keep it between us. Yeah. <laughs> like keep it between us. There's yeah, too much right. to be, I don't want a lot of other guys coming yeah, out here from out New York here. taking our jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you touched on it, but if you'd go a little further on Herman bringing out his brother or encouraging him to come. Yeah. Yeah. So Herman and Joe, I mean, their relationship soured later when things started to go South for Herman, you know, Herman was comfortable bringing out his brother when Herman was on top of the world, you know, working with the Marx brothers at Paramount and, you know, wrangling them and the successful pictures they had there. And, and Herman was the highest paid screenwriter in Hollywood for a time in the early part of the 1930s. And then, you know, he gambled it all away or gave it all away. He loved lending. People would borrow a thousand dollars from him. He'd give him 2000 because yeah. like you find a yeah. thousand will get you out of your hole, but then you need to something to kickstart your life. So, uh. and he never cared whether he got paid back. And then when he borrowed, he didn't always pay back. And so, and he gambles. Uh. Uh, so, but yeah, but, but bringing Joe out then was, you know, when Herman was a star, when things started to go South for Herman and then, and Joe ascended and Joe had a much more successful career overall than Herman. Um, I think that was difficult for, for, for Herman. And I think it was difficult for, for Joe. I mean, I don't think Joe, you know, I mean, I, I just, you know, I think about me and my brother and my brother's never, I don't ever think going to need my help, but like he'd get it without uh, me worrying for half a second, you know, so, you know, I, I don't know, Joe, uh, it, it's too bad because they were both brilliant and they clearly at one point, you know, really loved it. And they, to the end, I mean, when, when Herman died, you know, he told Joe to take a look and promised to make him t take care of, of my aunt, Joanna Josie, who was then, I think she was 16 when her father died. Oh, yeah. So tell me a little bit, if you would, I want to go back to Bob just for a minute, yeah. to Bob Osborne. When you took over, you're working with writers they were writing for Bob Osborne. That's not your style any more than his style is your, you know, I mean, just, you have different styles. Yeah. Yeah. And they're not even or some of them it's changed a little bit today. And we have a wonderful woman named Monica Elliott, who now sort of coordinates the script writing for everybody. And I mean, like right now I'm working on, I was working on scripts right before you called, like we had, you know, Debbie Reynolds is our star of the month for March, but it, a lot of March is spent on 31 days of Oscar. So we're not, we're doing the star of the month thing in March. Like the last whole week of March is going to be Debbie Reynolds movies. So I'm working on those scripts. So they've, I get them and they're written, but they're not in my voice and there's stuff I put in. I spend like anywhere from 15 to an hour on each script. Like, you know, the average I was figure, I figure it out a lot. It's like 23 minutes. So you work on them and I'm sure Bob did the same thing. He wrote on it. Like you'd see his scripts and there'd be, you know, margins. He'd write, you know, he'd write down the side with arrows pointing for where things should go. And then they would enter it into the prompter. And I did that a while because that's how Bob did it. And then literally one day in like 2011, I was like, I could use a computer for this, right? <laughs> they were like, yeah, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, we talk about the history of a film before you play it, and I was really fascinated by my favorite, you know, I can't stand it when they say, name your favorite movie, your three favorite movies, you're going to a desert island, what are you going to take with you? In those days, when they used to ask me that, I'd say 35 millimeter prints are too heavy. 
to take to the island. So you know, try to get out of it that way. But I, I do want to ask you, if I could, when you see a film like Casablanca, which we all love and many people like myself, let's just say I can't think of anything I would want to change in that movie. Watching movies as you do all your life and I my life, I often will say, God, I, I would have gotten out of this scene faster. I would have taken this one out. Casablanca, I don't say that about anything there. But I am interested in the fact that George Raft, once again, who kept turning down the best movies, this pants career, what he turned down could have made him the biggest star in the business. Yeah. Maltese folk and High Sierra and now Casablanca. But then you've got Reagan, Ronald Reagan turning it down. And then you have Well, let me let me interrupt you because it's you're right and not right. About Reagan, I know, yeah. Well, and it's unclear whether Raft turned it down because they sort of knew he'd turn it down. So the question would have been like they might it might have what's very clear is that as soon as Hal Wallace got the treatment from the script reader, like or you know, the script reader read it and had his notes like this would be great, and he has it, it'd be perfect for Bogart or, or Raft in his notes. Like Wallace read it and was like Bogart right away. That's who he wanted. So I don't know how he got around the Raft thing, but he wanted Bogart for it. And it was like a foregone conclusion that Raft would say no. And so who knows how they presented it to him if they had, right? if they did. Reagan was, it's a wonderful thing to speculate about because it would have changed American history if Reagan had gotten Casablanca, because I think he meant the movie still would have been really good and he would have been a bigger star and he may never have left, right? He may never have you know become governor, which means he's never president which means George H.W. Bush is probably never president. <laughs> and then his son, so his son's never president and we never have the Iraq war. Like yeah. that's, that's this fun little thing that I, that got me booed in Atlanta <laughs> at an event. The fact is he may never have made Santa Fe trail if we were lucky. That's right. That's right. So I, who knows, but even great movies, like a movie that's really also perfect, like the best years of our lives, like at the end of the movie, when Dana Andrews and uh, Teresa Wright are kissing, right. And Frederick March is there who's Teresa Wright's uh, father. And, and I want to go back in time and give William Wyler a note. <laughs> Right. I think March, given that he was, you know, resistant to that relationship, but he now he should see it. He's there. And I feel like he should see it and should just, you know, he doesn't have to nod or anything. He doesn't have to be corny, but just a moment where he sees it and something because he's the he was you know, he and Spencer Tracy to me are like the greatest actors who ever lived. And that he should just look at it and be like, Oh, okay. This is okay. Like I know this guy and that's my daughter, and it's okay. This is how it should be. But that's and then in Casablanca just because you brought it up. I just want, and I know it's the production code. Bergman takes out the gun. She points it at Bogart and he begs her to shoot him. And then she breaks down. I can't, I left you one. I couldn't leave you again. I said, you know, and then there it goes to black and then we come back and he's staring out the window and they obviously slept together. Right. Um, but they can't do that. I just want one button on his tuxedo undone. <laughs> Ideally I, the bow tie would be hanging down. Right. That's all we would need. Just the bow tie hanging down, suggesting that he had put his clothes back on. That's what I want. That's my one. That's my one note to Michael Curtiz for Casablanca. I think you're just pushing too much, Ben. That's too far. I think think this is really too far. Now, you know, it's funny. I spent a lot of the last couple of days looking at all the interviews you did. And on one of them, which really got me laughing, you said Eva Marie Saint owes me a favor. And like some interviewers, we never found out what it was. You said it. They asked another question. Do you want to reveal what that is? How would Eva Marie Saint, who I adore and who I must say, I have to say, is a big fan of mine. She was, by the way, a huge, great, close friend of Robert Osborne. She and Bob were incredibly close. So actually sort of meant a lot when she connected with me. Like even before he did, she was like, she blessed me which was really nice. Um, I don't know what the favor is. I can't, you know, but we, I once, every time I interviewed her and I'd wear like a nice shirt and jacket, but jeans, she would like my mom, she would be like, I can't believe you're wearing jeans. Right. (laughs) So she, we had her at the TCM film festival and, and uh, I come out and I'm, and I'm wearing jeans and I know she's just going to say it and I got a tie on everything. And she's like, she's like, well, even for the film festival, you couldn't, you couldn't see yourself (laughs) to wear a proper pair of pants. You have to wear jeans. And then I unbutton, I unbuckle the pants and I unbutton them. And she's like, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I take my <laughs> shoes off and I take my pants off and I have the suit pants on 
underneath the jeans. <laughs> it's a very nice moment there, but it was uh, like an Eva's howling, Eva Marie's howling. Uh, you can't call her Eva. She'll always point out it's Eva Marie. Well, you know, about the casting, I did a little research myself on Barefoot Contessa. Do you know that Bogart was not the first choice on that? That sounds right. I don't recall that. I think I've told that story before, but but who was the first choice? Gary Cooper. That makes sense. You don't think of Bogart also as a, although I'm not sure I think of Cooper either, as a Joe Mankiewicz character. No, either of them. But it was interesting. Now, I understand why he wanted James Mason for the role that Rosanna Brazzi ended up doing. That really made sense to me. You know? Yeah, that does make sense. Yeah. Well, Mason Mason was a I mean, that's like a gifted, gifted, gifted actor. Yeah. A guy who could be so likable, but then is so wonderfully duplicitous. Yes. And even when he's the bad guy, you don't fully hate him. It's true. And I had him on the show. I, I'm sure you've had this happen. I would sit across from Betty Davis or James Mason or John Houston, and I'd be asking questions and thinking to myself, I'm sitting across from Betty Davis and John Houston and James Mason. I mean, it would be incredible for me. And then Bob Hope and George Burns, and I I couldn't believe it. And to this day, years later, I'm in my 80s, and I'll say the same thing. Do you have that feeling at times? Yeah, it doesn't really go away. I mean, just this in the last week, the last six or seven days, and Bill Hader and Billy D. Williams, uh, not together. That would be a fun pairing, but yeah. <laughs> they were separate. And both times, I thought this is such a great job, right? It just it just occurs to you. It strikes you in the middle of things. I just I'm looking at a text I got now for a whole other project I'm doing. Uh, Morgan Freeman wants to do next week, and I'm like, how great <laughs> that I, you know, that I, I I don't know that I can figure out how to do it, but I'll find a way. I'm not gonna not not gonna spend whatever it is like an hour and a half with with Morgan Freeman. So yeah, I'll figure it out. Tell me a little bit about writing. Do you want to write a novel, do, or have you written a novel, or where are you with writing? It's it's certainly in your blood. It's in my blood. I'm okay at it. I'm very slow. You know, it's taken me a long time to figure out that like the rules are only rules until you break them, right? And so that, you know, the way I talk, I'd have to write a novel the way I talk, right? It's just, and and I wouldn't be the first to write a novel that way. So I think about it. I have some people, you know, who encourage me to, um, which is really nice. Um, I have no idea whether it would be any good at all, Um, whether it's a novel or whether it's, uh, you know, some book about movies that, you know, we could, I could trick people into buying. Um, um, uh, but I would like to write a book. I would. That's a feeling. I've, I've had a couple of, uh, I've had some very smart friends uh, write books and some less smart friends write books. And if they hear this interview, I hope they'll wonder, hey, which group am I in? <laughs> um, and I, but some of them are like, well, if this guy wrote a book, uh, I could write a book, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I actually ended up writing one or two books. I've finished my second. And the idea for me was I called it, try not to hold it against me, a producer's life. Yeah, that's good. It's a good title. Yeah, it's a good I title. Thought. It was kind of fun. I have, a, I have a great friend who's written a couple of books named Teresa Strasser and she's a, a wide door and uh, she did radio for a long time. She was Adam Carolla's co-host one of his co-hosts for years and years and years and then went into tv and uh it's just so hard and i am i I must say i this job when i got it back in 2003 this tcm job was was pretty sweet like i don't know i worked like i worked on the scripts and i'd go shoot every like six weeks it was like the easiest job in the world and now i work i don't know 60 70 hour weeks are not unusual it's not every week sometimes i can follow a 70 hour week with a 40 hour week, but it's hard. Like I literally see this thing about Morgan Freeman wants to do next week, you know, and I'm like, Ooh, that is going to be yeah, hard because there's going to be hours and hours and hours of preparation before I interview Morgan Freeman. Right. I'm not going to, you can't let Morgan Freeman come on and wing it. Right. You've read all these things. You can't, you got to watch some scenes. You got to remember, I want, there's a scene in Brubaker with Robert Redford with Freeman that I know I'm going to want to like reference also because it'll tell him that I watched everything, you know, and I, <laughs> but it's hard. Like, you know, you, you, you got to re- you can't read the Wikipedia page and then jump into an interview. No. In, in fact, when you read the Wikipedia page, you may find out you're getting it incorrect. That's right. It could send you down in the wrong direction. That's right. I mean, for example, just on that, I was told the two brothers, Joe and Herman, did 200 movies between them. Then I read the book by Miss Stern about the brothers Mangowitz. Yeah. She says 150. That's a pretty, at 25% you know, decrease immediately. I mean, it's probably closer to 200, I'm guessing, because of the number of movies that they both worked on where they were uncredited. But that's, yes. you know, and and that, um, by the way, that book is wonderful, and I'm glad you read it, but 
uh, my cousin, Nick Davis, who's also Herman Mankiewicz's grandson and Joe Mankiewicz's nephew, uh, Josie Mankiewicz's uh, and Peter Davis's kid. He wrote a book called Competing with Idiots, taken from yeah. the letter about Herman and Joe. And it's, it's more personal, you know, because Nick's part of the family and it's great. It's a really wonderful Whoa. book about Herman and Joe really about the nature of that relationship. And it's a very different read than Sidney Stern's book, which is also good. Well, I'm anxious to talk to you about the controversy about the writing of Citizen Kane, which I know you've spoken about a lot, but I'd like my audience to know from your point of view what should be known about who wrote it and how great it is. And you can't take one away from the other. You can't take both their contributions away. No. Well, first of all, the debate about who wrote the script is a little silly in the sense that it obfuscates what should be very clear. It's Orson Welles' movie. And I think we're all very grateful in the Mankiewicz family for Pauline Kael. But the mere fact that she, her dismissiveness about Welles' talent was the problem with that. And I think that's what got the hackles up of so many Welles acolytes was that it seemed to like, disregard him, that it was just like Robert Wise and Greg Tolan and Herman Mankiewicz who came together and put that movie together. And, you know, I mean, he produced it in the face of these tremendous headwinds and the performance is amazing. And he directed it and he contributed a little bit to the screenplay, but he made it all happen. He, and he was 24. It's a, an amazing accomplishment. It is, it is his movie in the sense that he directed it and had a hand in everything. We overstate the role of directors always, right? This is a collaborative art form. And the screenplay of Citizen Kane is critical to how great it is. And almost all the screenplay was written by my grandfather. It's my understanding of it. You know, the people who, who were there, Rita Alexander, his secretary. And, and Herman never even really bragged about it. You know, he just, he was proud of it. And Orson, you know, liked to overstate his, you know, he was under tremendous pressure too. And I love Orson Welles. I love Orson Welles. And again, let's not mistake it. Orson Welles' movie, 100%. No question. Yeah. But let's also not mistake the fact that Herman Mankiewicz wrote it. Yeah, Herman yeah. Mankiewicz wrote almost all yeah. of it, you know, and Welles culled it down and yeah. did a brilliant job in culling down a big screenplay. And Kazan, who I mentioned earlier, told me that for many years, nobody really did that, that directors, often real good ones, would work on a script, but they would not take credit. And yeah. he was he was saying to me that he was annoyed that he hadn't. He said, I should have. He said, because yeah. there were a lot of the films I really was the co-writer. So it's interesting that that came out from him. I was surprised that he told me that. Yeah, that, that's an honest thing to reveal. Did you like him? Oh, I was crazy about him. He was my mentor. He was the first person to believe in me. And Ben, you, you'll be uh, surprised to hear this, but he was so hot after On the Waterfront and having won the uh, Academy Award before that, not only for On the Waterfront, but Gentleman's Agreement, that Jack Warner wanted him so badly that they made a deal that he'd make a three-picture deal with Warners, and at the end of 10 years, the films would revert to Kazan. Wow. To Kazan. And that was Face in the Crowd, Baby Doll, and America, America. And that's how I ended up being the worldwide distributor for almost 35 years on a handshake with Kazan. We never had a contract. Never. That's nice. So, you know, I have issues with the way he talked about the blacklist stuff, but of course, I don't even really mind that he did it because I always want to remember who the real bad guys were, right? And real bad guys were the people who put people like Kazan in that position. I just wish he hadn't bragged about it in the way he bragged about it with On the Waterfront, but that in the book. But what I was just talking to, this will make, but I was, it was for TCM. So I, I finally got a chance to, we got Spike Lee who came in and did a couple of movies for a couple of things we have coming up this year. And, and we talked about A Face in the Crowd and Ace in the Hole, Billy Wilder's film with Kirk mm -hmm. Douglas from 1951. And what struck him was that Billy Wilder made Ace in the Hole, which did very poorly, right? Nobody saw it. Nobody wanted to see this depressing take on American media and American crisis culture. It was the movie he made after Sunset Boulevard, right? He's Billy Wilder. He could make anything. And he made this. And the movie that Kazan made after On the Waterfront was Facing the Crowd, which also didn't do any business and nobody wanted to see or hear. And that these guys who could do anything they wanted chose to do these incredibly bold, prescient, observant stories about what's wrong with us, I think is really telling about both of them. Well, you know, as you know, they tried everything on Ace in the Hole. They called it the Big Carnival. They tried to change the title. Yeah. But all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't do it. But what a movie that is. That movie yeah. is sensational. And I believe Face in the Crowd is one of the best. I asked Kazan, you, you'll like this. I said, what's the, anything about Face in the Crowd you don't think works? He said, 
I couldn't get Andy Griffith at the end to be mean. So I said, well, what did you do? He said, I took him to the Jack Daniels School of Acting. (laughs) (laughs) And he says he's drunk. In that scene, he is drunk. It's really, I mean, it's. I've seen it so many times. I just saw it. Barry Levinson came on TCM to talk about it. We'll have that on in a particular context later this year. It's just amazing. It's so perfect. And there's so many things I forget about it. Andy Riff is so good. I mean, it's so good. And he is mean in it. You know, he's got this passive aggressive cruelty sometimes, but he is, it's amazing that that guy is known to everybody is just, you know, as Andy Taylor is, uh, I almost find it regrettable, even though clearly Andy Griffith had the career that he wanted to have and God bless him. But man, he could have, he could have been a movie star. Oh yeah, he sure could have. I gave Kazan his 90th birthday party and Andy flew up. Oh, that's so nice to hear. I love that. Every time I opened my front door, Ben, I couldn't believe who was coming into that door for his 90th birthday party. So, yeah, I mean, look, there's no, I'm not apologizing in any way. Naming names is a horrible thing. But, you know, we all hope we would do better than that. But sometimes you just don't know what you'll do. The same in war. That's right. I love that about the movies. The guy who's been the kind of coward all of a sudden becomes the hero. And the macho guy all of a sudden starts to cry. So it's an interesting thing, human behavior, as we know. I, I'm a big Bruce Springsteen fan, and there's a and it was doing an interview years and years ago, 25 years ago, it must be. I think it's in a compilation of interviews with Bruce that I read it, but it, with Nick Hornby, the writer, wonderful writer, Nick Hornby. And there was a lot of talk about this was far before gay marriage, but there was still it was during a some particular part of a gay rights debate, and Bruce had just had it, maybe he had his first kid or second kid, third kid, something like that, and Nick. Had Asked him, you know, what do you think? You, you're you talking about gay rights. You think you'd be comfortable with your, uh, if it turned out one of your sons was gay? And Bruce said, I don't know. I hope so, but I don't know how I'd be. I hope I'd do the right thing, but I won't know until I'm put in that position, which I thought was a really great, honest answer. That's a great, honest answer. I uh, did the only movie with him, you know. I co-produced and co-directed No Nukes. Oh, wow. Well, wow. I have it. It's the artist that, you know, whatever. There's no amount of shows that I could see that wouldn't move me, right? The way yeah. the, the way art is supposed to move you. So I've yet to have a picture to hang on my wall, the painting that moves me. You know, some many movies do. But man, a three-hour, two-and-a-half-hour Springsteen concert just did whatever. Just every time. doesn't matter whether I've seen the exact same show the night before. I still get moved. Well, I was there for five nights in a row in Madison yeah. Square Garden. I had nine cameras. Haskell Wexler was my DP, but he hired the greatest documentary film people. And we had three definite positions and six roving cameras. And we had Thunder Road. We had He introduced the river that night, first time. Right, because it was 79 before the album came out. On the nose, Ben. I have a hunch I've met my match. Have you seen it again? Did you watch it? Because it was, was it last year or a couple of years ago that it got released? The funny thing is about that, I've made some movies and it's tough because rarely do you have exactly what you wanted. Either as a producer, you had to go along with the director. In this case, I was co-producer and co-director. There's a couple of things in there that it's hard for me to watch because I didn't want it in there. It's still there. I can't get rid of it. So no, I haven't seen it in a while, but I'm very proud of it because I worked a year with my co-producer and director, Danny Goldberg, and we took no money. And I think it's one hell of a good movie. It is. The, the Springsteen component of it is just, it's just great to see yeah. him, you know, and see him so young and, and, and vibrant. And anyway, it's great. It's a great, great, great thing to watch. Well, thanks. Now tell me, if you will, what can we talk about the future? I know you're not leaving TC. TCM, God help us. No, 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 no. Thankfully, uh, things came, it was a good year for TCM. It was, you know, it was, uh, you know, we weren't used to being in the headlines as much as we were uh, last summer, but all came out okay. And we got the great assistance and support from so many people in the Hollywood community, you know, namely Martin Scorsese and Steven Spielberg, Paul Thomas Anderson, but so many other filmmakers really stepped up for us and things are good now. And we're doing a lot of stuff. Um, That's why I'm so busy working these incredibly long, but satisfying hours. So uh, things are good. We got, I got a new podcast out now. I've done the plot thickens for, for four seasons. We have a fifth season of that coming out later this year. It's going to be really good. But I have a podcast that we're doing TCM in conjunction with Max called Talking Pictures, which is the first season is me and uh, uh, 10 filmmakers just talking about movies and movie memories, movies they've made and then movies they've loved. 
and why. And it's really fun and interesting. Mel, as we record this, I don't know when you're going to air this, but as we record this, the Mel Brooks episode is out. Cord Jefferson came out last week. Emerald Fennell, Nancy Myers. Uh, we opened. We opened with Nancy Myers. Steven Soderbergh also. Uh, Alexander Payne. You know, Bill Hader. Uh, it's really. Uh, uh, you know, it's these interviews. They're great. It's to be able to sit down for. I mean, they end up. The shows are like 45, 50 minutes, but the interviews are. You know, I go long. <laughs> There's just been great sitting down in, in this relaxed format where you don't have to put makeup on and. And there are no lights, and you just get to talk about movies. It's with people who who are passionate and love these movies. It's great. Yeah. Well, what's so great about TCM, and I know you've said this before, so I'll steal it and say, nobody ever yells, oh, I can't watch every show on ABC. But boy, on TCM, we are hooked. Those of us who love it, and I'm one of them, boy, do I love that channel. And I always feel, here I have a choice of 417 channels, and I can't find anything. And I run to TCM and say, whatever it is, let me hit there for an hour or two and see what they're doing. You know, it's part of people's identity. That's uh, And again, as I, you, you quoted me correctly, nobody says that about any other channel. You know, you might like stuff on that channel. Like, I mean, I like a lot of shows I like on Showtime. If somebody, uh, what do you watch? I go, oh, I love Showtime. They look, <laughs> they look at you like you were crazy. <laughs> I love show, right? You know, but TCM, those, they mean something to people. And, you know, I mean, most people have no idea who I am or what I do. But man, the people who watch, they care a lot. And being able to, I mean, Julian, it's not really fair. I mean, I, I get these people who thank me. I started this interview by talking about people thanking my father when we'd be at the grocery store in Washington, D.C. when I was a kid every week. And people come up to me and thank me, and they're thanking me for Ilya Kazan, and they're thanking me for Michael Curtiz, and they're thanking me for John Ford. Because I talk for two and a half minutes before Casablanca. Like, that job, I mean, it's so set up to succeed. So I'm super, super fortunate. Maybe so, but I think you're being not fair to yourself, but therefore I know you're a shy kid still somewhere. <laughs> so the answer is what you do is you make us want to watch that movie. You get us excited about that movie. Your passion, your excitement, your enjoyment, how you feel about it is translated over that screen. And I think that's what they're saying. They're also saying, thanks for my memories of my mother or me or my grandmother or whatever. That's right. No, that's, that's, you're exactly right. Thanks for making me think about my grandparents, even if I never saw this movie with them. Thanks for making me think about my dad and think about my mom. Yeah, that's right. That's what these movies do. Pretty powerful. It's true. It is powerful. So we've done it, Ben Mankiewicz. I can't thank you enough. I hope one day we actually can sit down and talk in person. But until then, I thank you for joining me today. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Julian. Thanks for joining us on Julian Schlossberg's Movie Talk. Remember to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Produced by Audavita Studios. Connect your voice to the world.